let's talk about overall challenges, generic challenges we face in managing our coastal and marine resources. In general, the framing again for our class is that um, we're asking, has the coastal zone become too complex to manage? Have either our abilities to respond to changing conditions or have the conditions changed such that um, it really is too hard to manage? And so that's something we'll be exploring throughout the course. Let's begin today with um, reading a few quotes um, for our historic perception of our coastal and marine environments. This first quote from 1812, and many of these quotes refer to fishing, uh, but, but this first one specifically talks about fishing. The fishing banks are an inexhaustible source of wealth, and the fishing businesses, the business is a most excellent nursery for seamen. It therefore deserves every encouragement and indulgence from an enlightened legislature. So the idea here that um, the this region of the world is inexhaustible, it's vast, we got to do whatever we can to encourage our harvesting of resources. A little bit later, same time period though, Lord Byron writes, roll on thou deep dark blue ocean roll, 10,000 fleets sweep over thee in vain, man marks the earth with ruin, his control stops with the shore. Again, deeply embedded in the wider consciousness of the public is this notion of the the ocean as vast and unconquerable. Huxley writes in 1884, probably all the great sea fisheries are inexhaustible. That is to say, nothing we do seriously affects the number of fish. By the mid 1900s, we're getting a somewhat nuanced view here. So here um, from 1955, we have a quote that says, as yet we do not know the ocean well enough. Much must still be learned. Nevertheless, we are already beginning to understand that what it has to offer extends beyond the limits of our imagination, that someday men will learn that in its bounty the sea is inexhaustible. Again, the same idea of, of this inexhaustible resource, this limitless resource, but we're beginning to get the sense of um, we can know it, we can understand it. We might not understand it now, but, but it is possible for us in some way, shape, or form to get our mind around this uh, vastness. Rachel Carson, the great mother of the modern environmental movement and ecological thinking uh, and environmental impact assessment, um, writes before she writes Silent Spring, when she's writing the sea around us, which is what gets her most interested in nature, etc., the coastal zone, the beach, tide pooling, etc. She writes in her uh, part of her first three books, which speak to the ocean. Um, it is a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself. Again, the inexhaustible nature, in this case of the waves and the tides, etc., but the realization that the stuff we value, the ecological functioning, the services, the life in that uh, region may not be perpetual and we might be screwing with it. And then here's a quote um, from a Chesapeake Bay fisherman. Uh, Most fishermen think that Mother Nature brought us fisheries, took them away, and that Mother Nature will bring them back again. The fishermen think that God brought us the oysters and that God took them away. I think that God brought us the oysters and people took them away. So that is a uh, relatively enlightened uh, uh, oysterman um, from the East Coast. Uh, not all uh, fisher folk think that way, but I would say, again, this is, this is representing this, this changed perspective, this continuing to change perspective. And then one of my most favorite quotes about the, the vastness and the power of of the coast and marine. Here's a picture of Santa Monica as we look towards Pacific Palisades. And the great uh, Ross McDonald, the noir, uh, a fiction writer, writes in his Drowning Pool from 1950, um, his, his character, the, the detective, goes and has a bad day and goes and gets in the ocean. He says, I turned my back and floated, looking up at the sky, nothing around me but cool, clear Pacific, nothing in my eyes but long blue space. It was as close as I ever got to cleanliness 
and freedom. As far as I ever got from all the people. They jerry-built the beaches from San Diego to the Golden Gate, bulldozed super highways through the mountains, cut down a thousand years of redwood growth, and built an urban wilderness in the desert. They couldn't touch the ocean. They poured their sewage into it, but it couldn't be tainted. There was nothing wrong with Southern California that a rise in the ocean level wouldn't cure. So, uh, you know, 70 odd years ago, uh, sea level rise is already in the, in the consciousness. Um, uh, and, and, and to be sure, the notion of the power of rebirth, etc., cetera, um, and arguing that even if we dump all our trash in here, there's still this rejuvenating power uh, of the ocean, but recognizing that humans are doing their best to try to screw with these resources. Okay. Ultimately, when we talk about stressors and, 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 factors that are constraining our resources. Um, there's ultimately two things. One, the number of people. Two, how those people utilize resources. So in terms of the number of people right now, we're about 7.9 billion folks. Uh, the best estimates from the UN and others are that we'll, we'll top out somewhere around 11 billion at 2100 and probably not much higher than that. Um, that's a gross quantity of people. If you look at the absolute growth rate, the highest Growth rate, gro growth rate we've had in recent um, decades has been in the 1960s. This is in the wake of World War II. The baby booms, uh, baby boomers have kicked in. Um, that's where we see our greatest growth. Um, we're probably not going to see that uh, rate of growth anytime soon. Um, and then we have the intensity. So how many people we have on the planet and how intensely they're using resources. So here's one example, which is energy usage. Nuclear and traditional biomass are relatively stable um, and, and, and are, are likely to be relatively stable going on to the future. However, these other sources of energy, uh, coal, uh, solar, et cetera, are expanding. So we um, have a lot of people on this planet and we are intensely utilizing resources. Both of those things together form the nut of our problem. We can see this in a whole variety of ways. So here's an, uh, but one example of, of how intense uh, we are merged with the number of people that we are. And this is a, a NASA image of um, the Earth at night with the clouds removed. And note, there's no fancy map underneath us here. There's no... Um, there's no uh, Google Earth or anything like that. We're simply looking at the light pollution from uh, our infrastructure, our built environment, and you can see the footprint of, our, of humanity, the outlines, particularly of the coastal zones, where we have the massive concentration of humanity. And we can go on and on and show a bunch of examples. I will not, but you're welcome to check out the Great Acceleration. The Anthropocene is marked with many accelerations, both in terms of um, the physical systems, the, the ecological systems, as well as our social systems. Um, and all of these, many of these, I should say, at least follow a similar trend of increasing change and increasing rate of change in recent decades. Okay, when we talk about challenges, uh, general environmental challenges, but, but of coastal challenges uh, also, um, we can break uh, things up into a, several different eras. There's many different schema that we can follow. I'm going to use this. We will use this for our class. Um, and I'll just note that uh, the dates here are going to vary a little bit. This is very much North American centric, very much sort of California centric. And um, these exact dates might shift a little bit depending on where we are on the planet or which coastal zone we're in. But, it, but this serves as a, as a useful um, uh, delineator for us in terms of our discussions. We have these different eras of our influence on coastal resources. First, we have deep history, which is pre-strong um, human influence. This is um, more than 40,000 years before now, more than 40,000 years before present. Humans have been a species for several hundred thousand years, but for a lot of that, we probably didn't have a, a massive impact on our coastal resources. Um, uh, really, that starts to change in the wake of that 40,000 YBP, when we um, become more abundant in terms of our hunter-gatherer, more efficient in terms of our hunter-gathering, more um, uh, impactful as we settle down and agriculture is birthed and we um, turn to um, 
uh, city building and, 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 and form currencies and all this and that. Um, then we hit expanding uh, human influence, particularly, um, uh, uh, you know, th that's continuing throughout that period. And then we're going to cut that off around 1500. Um, and this CE stands for common era. So you might call this 1500 AD, but that's going to continue up till about 1500 common era. And then we enter the colonial period. The colonial period, again, will vary slightly, but this is primarily uh, Western European powers colonizing other regions of the world with their society. Um, and that's going to go, that's going to span roughly from 1500 to 1900. We have the, the early, early exploratory period and then the, um, the commodification, etc. period of the colonial eras. But I just lumped that all together, colonial eras. Then we have the modern era right now and then in the future. Uh, for the purposes of most of our class, while sometimes when we talk about fisheries, et cetera, we might talk about deep history, but most of the time we're, we're going to just focus on the modern era, sometimes maybe going back to the colonial era. So these are the most important ones when we're having discussions of various ma current management challenges and recent management challenges for us to have some context um, and to draw upon what happened there. So again, we won't typically talk about colonial eras uh, uh, but I will just throw out an example here, which is we did have a strong influence on coastal uh, resources. For example, we could talk about um, uh, the stellar sea cow. This is a type of, uh, this is related to manatees and dugongs. Big, slow-moving coastal marine mammal. This is living in the northern Pacific, so around the Kamchatka Peninsula from Russia over to us in, in North America here, Alaska, etc. And the story with that, very briefly, is that uh, Stellar, he was a, um, a ship's captain, a whaler, and he discovered these things. Now, uh, it's true that their populations seem to have been greatly diminished by the native peoples that first settled uh, this part of the world, and they had a strong impact on them. When Stellar came up, the best estimates are something, maybe there's only 2,000 or so individuals around. Um, but regardless, there were, they were still around. They were still having their, their impact on the ecosystems. He described them in 1741. 27 years later, they were extinct. There were a few reportings afterwards where people said they thought they saw one or something here or there. But by and large, they were, they were gone by 1768, um, even if a straggler or two escaped some of the spears. So we were able to wipe out an entire species very quickly in the coastal zone, even in this old colonial era, which we think of as maybe being not particularly sophisticated technologically. Okay, then we get the modern era. And the modern era, I'm breaking this up into different 25-year steps, um, not following a, a specific year-to-year -year, um, breakdown, but rather representative time. So about 1900, about 1925, etc. The first one of these, 1900, is the progressive or neo-imperialism era. This is also the era that births um, um, much of our uh, thinking on conservation. The two, um, he, so Teddy Roosevelt is the dominant figure here in the Americas. Um, and, and the two um, yins and yangs that, 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 that battled continually with him for his attention and for our societal attention, and to a very real extent still battle to this day, are John Muir, who represents the preservationist side of, of conservation, and Gifford Pinchot, the first head of the U.S. Forest Service, who is the uh, arbiter, or who, who is the advocate for the utilit utilitarian approach to conservation. Um, uh, good and bad are going on in this era. So, for example, right here on the right, we see uh, Teddy Roosevelt um, more than a decade after he first established. Brenton Island, which is, uh, Brenton Island is in the Chandelier Islands. This is in the, off the Louisiana coast. This is a sand barrier island. And he set this aside because people were coming in and stealing the eggs of these birds that were nesting in the area and, and harvesting these birds solely so that people could have a trophy on their, in their study wall and, and have something rare. It was the TikTok of the day, as it were. So here, it's again, several years later, and he's sitting here uh, taking in the beauty of the area that he helped uh, preserve. So that's one aspect 
of this neo-imperialistic era. The other is on the left, which is Teddy Roosevelt in cartoon form in the new, that showed up in the New York Herald in 1903 with him and his big project of the Panama Canal, joining the Caribbean to the Pacific, uh, primarily as a way for American commerce and Amer American military power to move around. Um, and so, you know, not particularly consulting the people of Panama, not particularly consulting if, if folks that live there want this type of coastal management going on. So that's the that's the uh, the the, the progress, so-called progressive era. Then we hit um, the interwar period, the area between the era between World War One and World War Two. And for this, I'm, I'm this is really represented by large-scale environmental transformation, engineering our way, controlling nature, dictating how we want nature to behave from on high, so top down. This is an image of the Olmsted Bartholomew plan for parks in LA, but we had the same thing with water distribution from the Owens Valley, uh, with the replumbing of the Colorado River, and on and on and on. So the interwar period is really this period of top-down control and uh, engineering nature because we decided that we think we can do it better. The next period, the 1950s, uh, and, and the really the post-World War II era, era, which is the Cold War, here we begin to see signs, and, and this is most clearly represented by Rachel Carson here in her book, The Sea Around Us, which becomes a uh, documentary, nature, nature flick, and wins an Academy Award. Um, but really the, the notion of, oh my gosh, maybe just doing everything uh, because and not questioning um, the government because we're in this war with this existential threat called the Soviet Union, maybe that's not the best thing. And maybe some of these decisions... Um, we do need to scrutinize more closely. And so DDT being a classic one of those um, and for which she writes Silent Spring. Um, and, and we're still living with this legacy on the left. You see a drum, 55 gallon drum that's been dumped over the side of a barge and, uh, in Santa Monica Bay off of Los, the coast of Los Angeles and it's full of DDT and gunk inside. And we thought the way we deal with this toxic pollution is just shove it in the ocean and, and leave it. Um, the next era was really the era of the creation of the modern instruments of environmentalism, the modern um, uh, environmental policies and the modern environmental movement uh, represented here by Nixon, who we don't typically think of a Republican president as particularly being strong in terms of environmental protection, but he created the EPA uh, and was sort of at the helm when, when a lot of these uh, initial environmental laws were being drafted. To the right, I mean, to, to be sure, some of it was at least an attempt to distract from some Vietnam and, and Watergate and things. But nevertheless, um, he should be given credit for um, enacting these, these um, institutions. On the right is uh, a, a protest for or, or a political um, rally in support of what was then Prop 20, which would, which would go on to create the, the Coastal Commission the co and, and, and lead to the creation of the Coastal Act by the legislature two years later. Uh, more on that later. Um, <clears throat> uh, Santa Barbara oil spill and this notion of we really need to respond ahead of time and, and just sort of looking at our impact after the fact is not the right way to do it. We should get in front of these challenges and solve them initially before they become problematic. So that's the uh, 1975 era. And then we hit 2000. This is basically the Cold War era. And even though historians will draw 2001 as the marker of the global war on terrorism with 9-11, um, we can use 2000 for our, our shorthand. <clears throat> Importantly, this is the time when we're seeing illiberalism rise up. So illiberalism here, not, not meaning liberal politicalness, but, but um, the lack of support and, and the degradation of democratic institutions um, and the rise of authoritarianism. And, and of authoritarian power. So for example, uh, the main image here are some of these islands uh, that uh, China is continuing to try to claim because they have territorial ambitions in the South China Sea. In this case, it's a coral reef, coral atoll. And uh, they, in the middle picture, you see they've dumped all this sand and they've created dry land. And now they have a landing strip and they're gonna start to say, this is now our territorial uh, area. And the, in the, 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 the water surrounding this um, area is, are now ours, and uh, no regard for the coastal resource, no regard for the health of the coral reef, etc. Um, 
if we look down the right, uh, the lower right photo is the um, wall, uh, the border wall between Tijuana and San Diego, um, and the craziness that that's ensued. To the left of that are pongas, um, which also come up from Mexico uh, to smuggle in uh, illegal drugs or uh, folks, um, humans. Uh, into the country. Uh, to the left of that would be um, folks worried about illegal fishing and on and on and on. So all of this going on with this questioning of democratic institutions, questioning of the rule of law, um, et cetera, et cetera. Our current era, uh, that is only intensified. So um, particularly in the wake of, uh, well, during and then in the wake of uh, the COVID crisis, the global pandemic, we've seen a lot of these trends that started in, two th in the around 2000, 2001, just intensify. Misinformation, active deception, active rejection of experts, and uh, a, a true embracing of uh, illogic and, um, and, and not the common good, I think it's fair to say. These are huge challenges for those of us interested in managing uh, these resources for the good of all. Okay, so... Uh, that's a bit of the sort of history as far as what we're talking about when we mention coastal stressors. Let's talk about that. When we say coastal stressor, a coastal stressor, we are referring to an abiotic or biotic constraint on an ecological function. Yes, we will talk about social systems, the impact of this on home prices or social institutions, environmental justice, that kind of stuff. But, but for our class, we're going to focus on the impact on an ecological system. Uh, that's the stressor we will we will start the conversation with. These stressors have been changing. They've been changing in the general nature, their magnitude, and the frequency. Historically, stressors were dominated by natural factors, but increasingly in the last couple decades, and now absolutely it's the case, anthropogenic stressors are now the mainstay, are now the core of the things that are stressing out our system. These stressors are increasing uh, spatially and temporally. So, so whatever they were two decades ago, are, they're much, they were much greater a decade ago, and then this decade they're even greater. Some stressors have gotten so great, they're actually challenging the very integrity of our coastal ecosystems and reducing either the resiliency, the ability to ba bounce back, or simply changing the successional, pro the way these systems undergo succession and pushing us into alternative stable states because we're not able to bounce back. Uh, if we if we ask of the public, so here I'm going to be showing you guys some, some of our public opinion polling data um, from, from past years. So in this case, uh, we're looking, we asked folks, hey, what, what's, a, what's a larger influence on the goings on of the coastal zone? Uh, nature, humans, both or neither. And what we find is um, humans win out. And if we combine humans or both humans and nature, we find that most people, 91% of our population in Santa Barbara, Ventura, Los Angeles counties, 91% of us understand that humans are a major influence on our coastal zone. Um, we can talk about our coastal stressors, and, and these are the foremost, uh, uh, or the classic ones we could talk about, over-harvesting invasive species, uh, destruction or fragmentation of systems, and pollution. Um, now, I, I, uh, we ranked all these. I put you guys into uh, groups, and, uh, and, and we had some discussion over this. This is what you found. So this was ranking these from one being the greatest stress to four being the least uh, stressful. Um, in fact, uh, f this has never happened before, over-harvesting tied with pollution. You guys, you guys as a whole thought that those were um, equally uh, uh, most problematic, followed by destruction and fragmentation of systems. And then in the end, that was invasive species. So uh, generally speaking, this is what we always seem to find. So this is, uh, this, is, this is data when we asked about fisheries, the general public's attitude towards fisheries. We actually added in additional um, factors of ocean acidification and increasing temperature in there. So this one's a little bit more complicated. We've asked specifically about wetlands in the past. But the one that, we, that I just asked you guys and that we discussed, uh, the, and the one we've asked the most is coastal. And what we see here is a little bit different than what you found, Pollution, pollution almost always 
comes out as the number one threat. We've been seeing this since the 1970s when people started doing surveys about this. Everybody think thinks pollution is the biggest threat. Um, lots of implications for that. Pollution, all of these are real challenges and real threats, but I would argue that most um, coastal managers and folks that work in resource management would suggest that things like over-harvesting are in fact a greater, um, and, and, and indeed, probably habitat fragmentation, even more so than over-harvesting, is a bigger driver of system stress than pollution. But nevertheless, we all think, politicians all think, the public all thinks the answer is pollution. We gotta deal with pollution. Let's rank and deal with pollution first. In terms of coastal threats, we can talk about threats in nature and then threats in our social structures in terms of how we respond to those threats. Uh, so we can talk about individual stressors and we'll go over um, a couple of those very briefly um, to start with. Um, and those are important. There are also combinations of those stressors. They can be antagonistic to each other or unfortunately, all too often, they seem to be synergistic with each other and lead to greater impact than just the impact of, of an individual stressor in isolation. Socially, we have conflicting priorities, which we might call politics, as to what we think is, is where we should be focusing and where our priorities should be. Um, and then secondly, we have challenges with institutional effectiveness, or what we might call institutional ineffectiveness and dysfunction. And so the, the, the tools that we craft to respond to these threats maybe don't work right. As far as individual stressors, um, I'll, I'll highlight five of these for us for our class, it'll be important for us to touch back on as we go forward. Overharvesting, pollution, uh, loss, degradation uh, of, of ecosystems, introduced species, institutional effectiveness. In terms of overharvesting, um, when we ask people about this, and we ask, "Hey, are we are we regulating our fishery, our commercial fisheries, uh, too much? Are we doing about right? Are we underregulating? What have you?" Most folks don't know. So, or, or I should say the largest fraction of respondents say they're unsure, but of the folks that do say something, it's roughly about the same number of folks say um, that we're doing about the right amount as doing uh, under regulation. Relatively few people say that we're over regulated. They're very vocal, but not that many people think that we're over regulated. And many more people think we're under regulated than they think we're over regulated. If we ask um, what has happened, for example, to that resource that, that this fishery is supposed to be, that this management tool is supposed to be applied to, California's uh, marine fisheries, uh, m about half of our population uh, correctly describes them as having declined in overall biomass, um, uh, et cetera, uh, since the 1950s. Um, and if we ask about endangered species laws, uh, the most common answer always uh, for all the years we've asked is um, people feel we should expand protections for endangered species. Um, and then the next most common group is, is, is don't do anything to it. A relatively small fraction think that we should make our endangered species laws less severe and essentially no one, it's not distinguishable from zero, uh, no one thinks we should eliminate these laws altogether. In terms of pollution, we can talk about proximate and uh, so proximate would be um, things we most typically think about, uh, chemicals, thermal, noise, sound, etc. Some people break off climate change as a separate stressor. I don't think that makes logical sense. It, it is um, the consequence of, of the greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide emissions that we are generating, so it's really a type of pollution. Granted, it's a massive problem. Granted, it, it could warrant its own category, but, but really, in terms of this schema, it's really a type of pollution. If we ask folks what we think about our, 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 our policies here in California to respond to climate change, in this case, for example, cap and trade to deal with uh, emissions, the vast majority of people don't know about this. They're like, I've not heard of this. About two, almost two thirds of the people say, I don't know. Um, and then the rest, people think it's good. People think it's neutral. People think we're doing a bad job. It's, it's basically uh, uh, indistinguishable from one another. So, so not a huge amount of variation there. So most people um, are unsure what's going on and they're evenly divided for those that do know what's going on uh, as to whether it's working or not. I put habitat loss here and habitat fragmentation in quotes because 
Um, it's important for me to say I, I've lost the battle. Habitat fragmentation is what we call this phenomenon. In reality, we should be calling it ecological fragmentation or ecological uh, destruction. The term habitat, technically speaking, refers to the area where an organism lives. So if we talk about a snake, we could talk about snake habitat loss or snake habitat degradation or squid habitat loss or squid habitat fragmentation. But, but the term has just gotten away from us and it's now, you know, environmental loss or environmental fragmentation is really how most people interpret that. So I put habitat in quote just to emphasize that. Now we can talk about general uh, loss and fragmentation and degradation, or we can talk about, um, just like climate change, coastal development, which is a particular focus for much of our coastal management um, world. And has lots of implications in lots of uh, areas. Again, you could almost have it as its own category, but really it's a subset of degradation and loss. When we ask people about wetland change over the last 150 years, um, the vast majority of people, 65%, um, correctly describe wetlands as having shrunk compared to their distribution uh, 150 years ago when our state was created. But when we ask them the quantity, the magnitude of that loss, the magnitude of that impact, they almost always get it wrong. The answer is 91% of our historic wetlands have been destroyed um, uh, since, uh, since 1850, basically. Um, but most common answers are much less intense. So people get, get the direction of the change correct, but they get the magnitude wrong and, and usually quite significantly wrong. If we talk about introduced species, um, this question uh, is one where we asked about ranking from two, meaning a score of two means everybody loved it, everybody thought it was bit really great. If it's a score of minus two, that means everybody hated it, everybody thought it was really bad. And in this case, um, uh, the, the, the things that rank the highest of all our positive management decisions and actions in the past um, gets a score of a little bit over one. Uh, this question was, how do you feel, or, or you know, did we do a good job removing feral animals on the Channel Islands? Goats, pigs, etc. And it gets a score of about 0 0.88. Very high. Very high. So the most people think that this is a relatively good thing. So in other words, dealing with responding to this invasive species challenge um, is a good thing. And, and we did a good job and are continuing to do a good job in terms of uh, this challenge. Lastly, we can talk about institutional ineffectiveness. And this really comes from overlapping uses where we have someone wanting to put a fishing pier and a commercial shipping pier wanting to put a, a, uh, a shorebird nesting refuge and a, uh, you know, big hotel, that type of stuff. Um, so we both have overlapping uses where we all want the same area and a different view as to what the most appropriate beneficial use of this particular area is. Now we get at that in our survey by asking a couple different things. One, we ask about coastal governance. And here um, the question was, are we doing too much to manage our coast or should we be doing more? And very consistently we see about two thirds of the population say we should be doing more, more governing, not less. Even though in the, um, in the media you'll see a lot of people saying, oh, we're doing too much, we're doing too much. And it looks like a a 50-50 split, it's a very small fraction of folks think we're, we're quote unquote doing too much. And if we ask folks, do we have good management of the coast? Most folks, again, are, are, are unsure. And for those that do have an opinion, the no's are about twice the yeses. So when we ask, generally speaking, are we doing an okay job with this thing? Generally speaking, for any management issue, people tend to be pretty negative. When we drill down to the specifics, such as the example we just showed about uh, invasive species on the Channel Islands. We asked about the specific thing. They tend to be not 100% positive, but they tend to be more positive than when we ask them a generic assessment of our management. So you ask people, how are we doing fixing our roads? And people say, we're doing crappy. And you say, oh, how about the roads out in front of your house? Many more people are likely to say, oh, well, there, there we're doing a good job. Um, yeah. Okay. So then the last, I just want to mention uh, uh, the synergism. And so in this example, this is from a, a, a wetland example, but basically here we have how much wetland is being lost under different schemes. 
And when we, when we look at sea level rise, uh, these researchers estimated we lose about 13% of our wetlands. If we allow um, crab grazing of the vegetation, etc., cetera, um, we would lose about the same, about the same amount of our wetlands over um, the period of this uh, study or, the, or projected period of the study. If these factors were additive, we would take the 13, add the 14, and find that we would be losing 27% of our wetland. If these factors were antagonistic towards each other, you'd expect less than 27%. Unfortunately, what we often find is that we see the reverse. Synergism is really important. And so, um, in fact, what we find is that in practice, when you look at both these factors, when they're both at play, both grazing and sea level rise, we will be losing 86% of our salt marsh. So, so um, we need, so the impact of these stressors is much greater than the individual calculation and simply adding them together or doing some simple association oftentimes is insufficient. And this is, this is another example, that same thing, just shown with some, some invertebrates, in this case from, um, over in Europe, and basically um, we can look at uh, temperature with and without a uh, pollutant, and what we find is um, might not be a huge difference between, say, the pollutant or not the pollutant, or the um, temperature or, or the warming or the re ambient temperature, but when we add them both together, for example, that, that drastically changes the abundance of um, bivalves. So again, a synergistic response. Um, I asked you, you all what were some examples. You guys came up with some examples of, of uh, things that were mostly single stressors that just got worse. Um, and so, uh, but other examples, some examples include things like um, uh, dam, you know, damming uh, uh, coastal waterways and the, impl the impacts on uh, sediment, et cetera. This could also include wildfires plus damming plus poor maintenance of dams, et cetera. So, so the, the synergistic stressors are really the outcomes that we can't predict from any one thing. It's not just that it gets worse, it gets, it's that it gets uh, exponentially worse. And then we talked about conflicting coastal priorities. Uh, generally, this is about competition for resources, most explicitly competition for space. Um, usually one of these uh, uh, factors has a detrimental impact on the other. There can often be, not often, but there, there can be conf conflicts, conflicts even between um, agencies. So the fisheries agency might be fighting with the road agency, might be fighting with the conservation agency, et cetera. And this also can be manifest when we start the process with conf conflicting values and, and fail to appreciate the values of others. Institutional effectiveness, there's all kinds of examples we can talk about this. Uh, local coastal plans across the state. Most of our local coastal plans for how counties and cities will do their development date to the 1980s. They're way out of date. They should have been updated much, much more sooner than that. But there isn't the funding, there isn't the mechanism, and so they languish. Institutional ineffectiveness. Uh, we've developed a lot of the turbines that are getting ready to go in offshore wind off of Oregon and the ones that are already in the water in Mexico, um, but they're not in California. So our colleagues at Cal Poly have a great new center to help facilitate this in the state, but the point being our, our institutions are not able to bring this, this resource into the state of California, or at least historically have not been able to, so that's ineffectiveness. Um, environmental laws have unfortunately become a force for nimbyism, especially in things like housing in the coastal zone. This past weekend, 72 ships were outside of the Port of Los Angeles and not being offloaded. A huge delay caused by COVID, caused by the global supply chain shortage. But um, the point being, we're not really able to, to get those guys moving a whole lot faster at this point. So that means our institutions are, are ineffective at, at freeing up space, etc. And then we can talk about things like biological resources that get poached, biological resources that, um, uh, that are... Uh, not properly managed by um, fishing game and other entities to prevent their loss. And then I just have a picture here of Hollister Ranch and, and the coastal access stories there. So in summary, we talked about different eras uh, of uh, challenges and of management history. 
In particular, we're going to be focusing on the modern era, 1900, 1925, 1950, 1975, 2000. Again, um, these are representative times. If you're looking for support or evidence as to what was going on, I would suggest that you, you start with these days uh, dates as your, um, as, as your organizing principle for searching for information and uh, data to support your claims. Coastal stressors, again, abiotic or botic constraints on ecological function. They're changing their nature, magnitude, and frequency. And um, some stressors are to the point now where ecosystem integrity is being questioned, and we are either losing these systems altogether or they're switching to an alternative stable state. We talked about threats in this class. We'll mostly talk about individual stressors, um, but do realize that they are synergistic. Um, in terms of how we respond, our, our social institutions can have conflicting priorities, and increasingly we're seeing ineffectiveness of these institutions in terms of being able to rise to the challenge of some of these new um, uh, resource management uh, sticking points that we really need to address better. And then we talked about uh, some of the, the classic uh, uh, individual uh, stressors that we'll see time and time again, overharvesting, pollution, uh, loss and fragmentation, introduced species, and institutional effectiveness. Thanks, you guys. I will see you soon. Have a good one.